Okay, uh, it's recording. Uh, welcome back, everyone, uh, for the part two of lecture 15. So just to remind what we did uh, in part one, we were discussing about um, the definition of the Hamiltonian operator in quantum mechanics. So we started by uh, taking the classical Hamiltonian, which stands for the total energy of the system. And here we are just considering a particle of mass M that uh, is subject to some potential U of X. And the quantum Hamiltonian or the Hamiltonian operator is just defined by the promotion of um, the, the momentum and the position to operators as we have learned. So the momentum P becomes P hat and uh, the position X becomes X hat. So now this is an operator. So it acts on states. And as we just saw the position representation of the momentum operator and the position operator, we can also make a position representation of the Hamiltonian. So we saw that the momentum operator is like, it acts like a derivative operator. So here I have momentum squared. So this will be a second derivative. And the position operator in the representation of position space is just a number. So you just substitute uh, the x hat by the number x, okay? So you have now this Hamiltonian written in the position space, and now it acts on wave functions. So eight, uh, eight hat will act on psi of x, giving rise to the second derivative of psi and uh, the product of the potential energy uh, um, with the wave function. So this is the form of the Hamiltonian operator uh, in position space. When you are dealing with um, a particle with mass m, and remember that here we are just considering a one-dimensional system. So of course, if you want to treat a particle that moves in three dimensions, then you have to um, take into account uh, all these directions. Uh, so instead of having just a derivative in the direction x, you are going to have uh, derivatives along the other directions as well. So you have to, to work out uh, carefully this generalization. But then uh, we move to the discussion about the Schrodinger equation. So as we discussed, this equation is the quantum mechanical analog of Newton's law. So now I want to understand how a state that I know at an instant of time t0 evolves uh, in time. So um, the, the Schrodinger equation tells you that the time derivative of the state times this uh, number, which involves the complex number i and h bar, is equal to the Hamiltonian operator acting on the state. So you see that the operator that generates uh, the time evolution of the system is the Hamiltonian. And this is a very important uh, uh, piece of information when you consider um, um, uh, symmetries in quantum mechanics, for instance. You want to, to define which operators uh, are responsible for time evolution, also for translations, and, and so on and so forth. But we are not going to discuss uh, more about this. Um, as we just did with the Hamiltonian operator, we can write uh, the Schrodinger equation in the position space representation. So this will be an equation that tells you how the wave function evolves with time. So the Schrodinger equation will be 
uh, the time derivative of the wave function. And here I am substituting the Hamiltonian by the expression that I just derived, which is the Hamiltonian for a single particle in one dimension with mass m subject to a potential u, okay? So this, this is what we have discussed in part one, uh, uh, essentially. But now I want to apply um, this, uh, all this knowledge that we have developed along these three weeks um, to solve, uh, or at least to point to the solution of a very important physical system, which is the simple harmonic oscillator. So, um, if you think about classical mechanics, you learn how to solve the equations of motion of a harmonic oscillator, which uh, you can take to be concrete as just this mass M that is attached to a spring that is fixed on a wall and you, you um, take this mass to some point um, where the spring is not relaxed anymore. And if you just let this mass to move and if there is no friction uh, between the mass and the floor, and if this spring is also ideal, then this mass will be oscillating um, around this equilibrium position, which I call x equals to zero. So this mass will be oscillating forever. And in a classical description, it will have a position that corresponds to the maximum displacement with respect to the position x, x equals to zero. And it will be oscillating in a harmonic motion. So you describe that by a periodic function, like a sine function or cosine function. But this mass will be oscillating around x equals to zero. So let me remind you how to describe the total energy of a mass that is attached to a spring of a characteristic constant k. Okay, so the total energy of this mass will be the kinetic energy of the mass, which is p squared divided by 2m, plus the potential energy, the elastic potential energy, which is associated to the fact that you deform the spring and therefore you store energy there that you convert to kinetic energy. So the uh, the the potential energy associated with this elastic force is given by the so-called Hooke's law, and it is essentially this constant, which is a constant associated with this spring. So if you have different springs, you're going to have different constants uh, times uh, the position squared of the mass measured with respect to the to the relaxed position of the spring. So x equals to zero measures the position of the, the, the particle when the spring is relaxed. But if I move the spring and I deform the spring, then x will measure how much the spring is deformed with respect to the position x equals, x equals to zero. So you take the position square and divide by two. Um, when you solve this system classically, um, you define, because this is an oscillatory motion, we can define a frequency. And in particular, we can define an angular frequency. And this is defined by the square root of the characteristic constant divided by the mass. And I can rewrite, I can just take this, this constant k that appears in the Hamiltonian and replaced by omega. And uh, as a consequence, the Hamiltonian can be written now as p squared divided by 2m plus the mass of the particle times the angular uh, frequency squared x squared divided by 2. And this is the classical Hamiltonian of the system. 
and it is written in terms of um, um, the momentum of the particle and the position of the particle. So now I can apply the quantization rule in order to find uh, what is the Hamiltonian operator. So the quantization rule tells you, well, just replace momentum and position by the corresponding operators. So the position operator, sorry, the momentum operator will be replaced by p hat and the position operator will be replaced by x hat. And this is the, uh, the Hamiltonian operator of a harmonic oscillator, okay? So now that we know how to write the, the Hamiltonian operator, um, we are going to define two auxiliary operators that, as you're going to see, they play a crucial role when you want to solve the harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics. And these operators that I will denote by A hat and A dagger hat, um, they are defined uh, um, in terms of the position and the momentum operator. And I introduce here also some parameters associated with the system, namely the mass of the particle and the angular frequency. Um, as you can see, this operator A is definitely not Hermitian, and the Hermitian conjugate of this operator is A dagger and is a different operator. Um, for reasons that will become clear uh, in a moment, um, these operators are called respectively as annihilation operator and creation operator. So A is the annihilation operator and A dagger the creation operator. And since they are written in terms of X and P, uh, and we know how X and P uh, uh, what is the commutator of X and P, then I can just compute the, the commutator of A with a dagger. And you can work out this expression just by using the canonical commutation relation between X and P that we have discussed um, some slides ago. So this relation here. And if you use that, you can arrive uh, at this expression. So A commutator, A dagger is just the identity. So this is an exercise for you. Just show that this is true, okay? Um, now I'm going to define another operator in terms of this uh, annihilation and creation operators. And this is also for future reasons that you're going to find out called the number operator. The number operator is defined as n hat, and it is Hermitian, so this is very important. And it is defined as the product of A dagger A. So this is the definition of the number operator. And just because uh, A dagger and A are functions of x and p hat, then I can just work out the expression of n hat in terms of x and p. So again, this is uh, uh, just a matter of replacing a dagger and a by the corresponding expressions in terms of x hat and p hat. And just by multiplying uh, uh, the operators here, you're going to get uh, something of the type x squared hat p squared hat and the commutator between x and p. So you can see how this expression um, emerges from this calculation here. And then if you just replace x hat commutator with p hat, you can just find out that the number operator is nothing but one over omega h bar times the Hamiltonian operator minus one over two. So what you are doing here is you are writing the number operator in terms of the Hamiltonian and a number times the identity operator. 
So I can just write instead the Hamiltonian in terms of the number operator. So this is a very simple thing. I mean, you just manipulate this expression and you get that the Hamiltonian operator is h bar times omega times this operator here, which is the number operator plus one over two. And here you should understand that there is an identity operator implicitly, okay? So to summarize, the Hamiltonian can be written in terms of the number operator. Then what? Um, you can just, uh, be because the Hamiltonian and the number operator are just related in a linear way, then if I find the eigenstates of the number operator, these eigenstates will be automatically eigenstates of my Hamiltonian. So let me define the eigenstates of the number operator as being the cat n. And if I act with n hat on the cat n, I get a number n, which is the eigenvalue associated with this eigenstate times the eigenstate n. So if I say that this cat n is an eigenstate of the number operator, then you can easily show that the Hamiltonian acting on the cat n will give to you, well, you just have to act with the n hat here and the identity here, so it will give to you h bar times omega times this number n, which is the eigenvalue of the um, of the operator of the number operator plus one over two. So the energy eigenvalue will be h bar omega multiplied by n plus one over two. And just following the postulates of quantum mechanics, those values will be the values that you're going to measure for the energy of the system if uh, you, you perform uh, uh, um, a measurement on, this, on, on the corresponding quantum system. So these are the possible values of energy, okay? Well, but so far we don't know much about this number n and we're going to come back to, 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 to this point. But let me elaborate a bit more uh, on the relation between the creation and annihilation operators and the number operator. So this is an exercise that I strongly recommend that you do, which is to prove that actually uh, the anti-commutator of n hat and the annihilation operator is just minus the annihilation operator. And likewise, if you apply this to the creation operator, you are going to get a um, dagger. So this is something that you can directly show by uh, substituting here the definition of the number operator, okay? Good, so um, because we understand now how the commutator between n hat and a hat uh, uh, behaves, then I can just act so look what I'm doing here. I'm taking n hat and acting on the state that is generated by the action of a dagger on n. So a dagger is an operator. So when it acts on the cat n, it will give rise to a new state. And then I will act with the number operator on this new state, okay? And, um, well, n hat times a dagger, I can write it, so this is just an, an, an equality that you can verify, as the commutator of n hat a dagger plus a dagger n hat. And I can act with this operator here on n. Okay, 
And you see that the commutator between n hat and a dagger is just a dagger. So I can just replace this commutator by this uh, a dagger. And um, this, uh, uh, this, this product of a dagger and n hat will also, I mean, I can keep it here because I know how n hat act on, uh, on, on the eigenstate n. So when I act with this operator on n, I will just keep like that. So a dagger acting on n. And here, when I act with this product on n, n hat will hit the cat n and it will give rise to the number n. So in, in the end, I have that the action of n hat a dagger on n is just one plus the number n a dagger eigencat n. So you see that this state a dagger n is also an eigenstate of n hat with eigenvalue one plus n. Um, similarly, you can do the same calculation using a instead of a dagger. And the conclusion that you get is that if you act with the a, a uh, if you act with a hat on n, this will also give rise to an eigenstate of the number operator with eigenvalue n minus one. So you see that when I act with the a dagger, the eigenvalue increases by a unity, so n plus one. And when I act with the operator a, I decrease the eigenvalue by one. So that's uh, this hints why we call this a creation operator. So I'm creating this, this plus one here. So I'm uh, increasing the eigenvalue. And here I am decreasing the eigenvalue, so that's why we call it annihilation operator. Um, okay, so, uh, but look, um, since the annihilation operator A acting on N is an eigenvector of N with eigenvalue N minus one, then, the action of A on the cat N must be such that this state is a number C times the, the, the cat N minus one, because you see that when I act with the number operator on this state, I get the eigenvalue N minus, N minus one. So we can, um, discover uh, uh, what is the value of C by demanding that these eigenstates are normalized. So if you demand that this operator, that this cat is normalized, then you have to take, to take the scalar product of this vector with itself. And therefore you have to compute what is the bra associated with this uh, state. And the bra will be bra n. And then I have to take the dual of a. And we know that when you take the dual of an operator, you have to write the Hermitian conjugate of this operator. So this will be n a dagger times a acting on n. But a dagger times a is nothing but the number operator. So this will be the number operator sandwiched by n, n. And when you apply the number operator on the state n, you know that you get simply n. And the bra n acting on the cat n, assuming that it is normalized, is just one. On the other hand, if I use this expression here, this will simply be uh, the absolute value of c squared. So the conclusion is that the absolute value of C squared must be equal to N. And 
by playing with global faces, I can take C to be real and positive. And therefore, C will be the square root of N. Okay? So, in summary, A hat acting on N is the square root of N times the eigenstate N minus 1. Okay? Um, well, you could proceed with the same strategy, but instead of using A, you use A dagger. And you get to the conclusion that A dagger, when acting on uh, the cat N will give a cat N plus one with um, this coefficient, which is the square root of N pl plus one. So you see that when you act with the annihilation operator on a state N, you get the state N minus one with a number. And if you act with the creation operator on a state um, n, you get a state n plus one times something. So again, this gives a hint why we, want, we like to call them creation and annihilation operators. But of course, I can just keep applying creation and annihilation operators to this state. So if you act now on this equation, if you act with a Again, you are going to get, uh, uh, when you act with A first, you get the square root of N, and you get the state N minus 1. And now if you act again with A on the state N minus 1, you are going to get square root of N minus 1, and the product will be this number. And the state, the final state that you get is the state N minus 2. Uh, and you can keep acting with uh, uh, annihilation operators, okay? So you're going to get this number, and this is easy to verify. Um, but uh, there is another important requirement, which is that this state that I generate acting with A on the uh, eigenstate N, this must have a non-negative norm. So if I demand that this state has a non-negative norm, then I get to the conclusion, because this will again combine in a number operator, I get to the conclusion that the number n, which is the eigenvalue of the number operator associated with the eigenstate n, must be uh, bigger or equal than zero. So this uh, uh, requirement of the positivity, or I mean, more precisely, the non-negativity of the norm of the, um, um, the, the, the state A n, it gives to us the information that n, the eigenvalue of the operator n hat, must be a non-negative number, OK? Um, so, well, we know that is no negative, that's good, but we don't know much more, okay? So let's assume that actually this is, I mean, this can be a non-integer number, but positive or non-negative. So if we assume that n can take non-integer numbers, uh, values, then we can just take the state n and start acting on n with uh, the annihilation operator. And if you act uh, a sufficient, let's say, um, uh, 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 amount of times with the operator a on n, at some point there will be a number m such that n minus m will be uh, uh, negative. So this means that the state n minus m would have negative norm. But this contradicts the, the requirement that uh, these states have no negative norm. So since this is an absurd, we have to 
uh, require that n is an integer number, okay? And because n uh, uh, is a non-negative non -negative, uh, integer number, we can act uh, with uh, uh, the annihilation operator on a state, uh, and then n will be decreased by one, and you can keep acting with the annihilation operator until the moment that will be that there will be a state that I'm calling here n star, that the action of the annihilation operator on this state will just give zero, because n star minus one will be zero. So this n corresponds to n equals one. So the smallest uh, value that n can take is zero. And therefore, if I look back to the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian operator, then of the harmonic oscillator, then uh, the smallest value of energy that I can get is this one, one over two h bar times omega. So you see that um, I cannot have uh, energy is smaller than that because uh, the, the eigenvalues depend on the number n that can be uh, uh, decreased up to zero, but not smaller than that. So the ground state or the state with the smaller smallest energy is the state that I call uh, the state associated with the energy E naught. And this state is what we call the ground state or the vacuum, which we denote by the cat with zero inside because this corresponds to N equals to zero. Uh, if I know the, the vacuum state or the ground state, namely the state with energy being half of h bar times omega, I can, I can construct states where the energy is increased. And you increase the energy just by acting with creation operators on the vacuum state. So if I act with the, um, a dagger operator, uh, um, on the vacuum state, you know that this will be just by uh, this uh, expression here, this will be a dagger acting on zero, this will be just square root of one, which is one, times the state uh, which corresponds to n equals one. And the energy then will have a contribution with n equals one. So this will increase the energy. And that's why we call these states where you have more and more um, um, uh, uh, values of n, so largest values of n, we call those states excited states. So if you keep acting with a dagger and then you act with a dagger on one and put the corresponding normalization factor, you are going to generate the state with n equals to two. So this is the state which has more energy than the state uh, uh, with n equals one and with n equals to zero. And you can keep acting with a dagger up to arbitrary n, and you can generate the cat n from the vacuum. So if you know the vacuum and you know the creation operators, you can generate the eigenstate n. Um, so uh, you see that uh, just by knowing how the creation operators act on the vacuum, then uh, uh, you see that the energy that is associated with the state n that you just generated here from the vacuum is, as we already saw, this value here. Um, these eigenstates uh, n, they are eigenstates of a Hermitian operator. And therefore, for different eigenvalues, these eigenstates will be orthogonal. 
So actually, because they are also normalized, this will be a, an orthonormal basis. And in this way, I can compute the matrix elements of the annihilation operator A and of the creation operator A dagger. So in order to compute the, the matrix elements of these operators, I have to sandwich them by the states n and n prime. And here you just have to play the game of acting with creation and annihilation operators on eigenstates of the number operator. And you see that if you act with a creation operator, sorry, with an annihilation operator on the cat n, you're going to get the state n minus one uh, times the square root of n. And then you have this scalar product, which is either one when n prime is equal to n minus one, or zero when they are different. So I use here the Kronecker delta, which gives this information in a compact way. If I do the same with the dagger uh, operator, namely with the creation operator, you get essentially the same thing, but with a different prefactor because, um, um, well, this, this is a creation operator, not an annihilation operator. And pay attention also to the indices of the Kronecker delta, because here you have n plus one, and here, here you have n minus one, okay? Good. Uh, so, we know how to write the matrix elements of um, creation and annihilation operators using the basis that you construct out of eigenstates of the number operator. But the creation and annihilation operators, they are expressed in terms of the position and the momentum operators. So I can ask, what are the matrix elements of the position and the momentum operator when uh, I want to use the eigenstates of the number operator? And then just by writing position operator and momentum operator in terms of creation and annihilation operators, I can compute what are the matrix elements of X hat and P hat. So I just have to substitute X hat by the sum of annihilation and creation operators and the momentum operator by this combination of creation and annihilation operators. And just by acting with A and A dagger on the eigenstates of the number operator, I will get this combination of factors that they give to me what are the matrix elements of position and momentum operators, okay? So uh, you see that uh, just by constructing these states that correspond to uh, eigenstates of this operator that we defined and called number operator, and essentially it's a number operator because it counts how many quanta of energy you have in a given state, um, you can read off the, the matrix elements of position and momentum operators. Uh, also, we can compute uh, uh, the energy eigenstate, which is also an eigenstate of the, the number operator, uh, in the position representation, namely the wave function. And to start with a simple thing, let's start with the vacuum. So the vacuum is defined as the state where uh, when you act with the annihilation operator on it, you get zero. So now if I act on this state with the bra x prime and I replace A by the representation in terms of x hat and p hat, I get this uh, 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 scalar product here. And just by going from the position, to, sorry, go into the representation of the position and momentum operators in position space, the x hat 
will become just the number x prime and the momentum operator will become um, um, minus h bar times the derivative with respect to x prime and this will be acting on the wave function and you see that I have an index zero which is which represents the fact that this is the wave function associated with the vacuum state okay so this is a differential equation you can solve this differential equation by different methods but the normalized solution of this differential equation is written here and you see that it is an exponential of uh, a number which is negative and then x prime squared this is what we call a gaussian so this is a gaussian function and it is um, it is a function that has the peak where this uh, uh, this argument here this x prime will be zero okay and then you have a behavior that goes up and then it goes down right so this is the wave function that describes um, the vacuum state of a harmonic oscillator and you see that you obtained this eigenstate of energy so this is not the time dependent wave function this is just the 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 part of the wave function that is an eigenstate of the hamiltonian right so you have to remember that schrodinger equation involves on the right hand side the action of the hamiltonian on a cat and therefore this will give rise you can you can write that in a simple way if you write the cat um, in the basis of uh, uh, energy eigenstates and this is what we are doing okay so finally just by playing the same game that we played um, here by acting with a dagger on the vacuum you can construct the wave functions or the uh, spatial part of your wave functions um, of excited states so this is not a complicated exercise but you have to do it carefully and you can just show that for the excited state psi n the expression for it is just this combination of factors here that depends on n and then you have to act with this operator n times on the exponential so you're going to have a complicated function and if you start at the problem of solving the harmonic oscillator directly in the language of wave functions the problem from the beginning would be the solution of a differential equation and fortunately for this specific differential equation we know the solutions and they are this type of functions okay so now that we have uh, the the states uh, we can ask what is the expectation value of um, um, the operator x hat squared and p hat squared on the ground state let's take the ground state just for simplicity so the expectation value of x hat squared will be this number h bar divided by 2 m omega and you see that there is uh, some relation between the coefficient that appears here and this number that appears here you can work out better uh, to understand this uh, this relation and for p hat squared you get h bar m uh, omega divided by uh, 2 however if you compute the expectation value of x hat and p hat you get zero okay so with this i can compute the uncertainty on x and the uncertainty on p here i am taking the square so 
this is really the 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 square deviation um, and these will be the numbers they will just coincide with the numbers that we just reported above and i can take the product of these two uh, uh, square deviations and this will give h bar squared divided by four and if you remember the heisenberg uncertainty um, um, relation this is exactly the bound of the inequality. So the ground state of the harmonic oscillator is just saturating the bound, okay? So you can also do the same calculations for excited states, and you can show that actually when you do the calculation for excited states, then you increase this number by this uh, uh, factor n plus one over two squared, okay? So this is, uh, uh, for excited states, the product is, is, not, uh, is not the bound, but is a bigger number, okay? So um, you see that I could work uh, out the solution of the harmonic oscillator um, using this technology of operators acting on cats, and then we define this number operator and define annihilation and creation operators. And why this is particularly useful? When you learn about uh, more advanced topics as quantum field theory, you're going to see that the description of quantum fields is in terms of harmonic oscillators. So you're going to have a bunch of harmonic oscillators, and these harmonic oscillators will create states of particles. So you're going to have states where you create or annihilate particles. So there you're going to have this interpretation. Here we are just talking about creating or annihilating quanta of energy. But there you're going to construct states where when you act with creation and annihilation operators, you create or you destroy particles. And the technology that you use there is precisely the technology of the harmonic oscillator. So in these three weeks, what we did was essentially to set the stage to construct this entire framework of quantum mechanics and develop this very non-intuitive language of quantum states and how you, um, what are the postulates of quantum mechanics that uh, explains to you how to extract physical information from a state. And now you're seeing that you can get information about the quantum state by using this whole technology uh, uh, together. And as I said, uh, uh, when you go uh, to more advanced topics as quantum field theory, but also condensed matter or quantum optics and many different areas, you are going to solve systems that will be represented by, in some approximation and others under some assumptions, by harmonic oscillators. So this is the very, uh, let's say, fundamental system that you have to know how to solve in quantum mechanics, but also you can solve many different uh, quantum mechanical systems by choosing different Hamiltonians. I'm just focusing on this system because this is very important for uh, more advanced uh, 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 courses that you're going to take. So with this, um, um, I really hope that during these three weeks you have learned, let's say, the very basics of quantum theory from its birth with uh, uh, the black body radiation. And now with this uh, framework, which is quite systematic and where you have clear rules on how to proceed in order to extract physical information about your system, okay? So with this, um, um, 
I am done with the topics that I would like to cover in this lecture, uh, in these lectures. And yeah, so now I think you have all the uh, fundamental ingredients to uh, do more advanced quantum mechanics and combine, for instance, with what you saw in the other course, uh, which is relativity. So you can combine uh, quantum mechanics with um, uh, special relativity, and this leads naturally to quantum field theory. And of course, uh, there is the, the big challenge in physics, which is how to make quantum mechanics compatible with general relativity, which is the problem of finding a consistent theory uh, of the gravitational field at the quantum level. And since you have learned that the gravity, you have to find a theory on space time. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. And this is uh, the end of the lectures. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.